fear that we fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. They will run to the house, let them have very good hot flesh. Now I show me for it. Now for them, they are pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers, get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello, welcome to Varn Blog Solo, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the discourse and about criticism, and about the function of both. One of the ironies of the historical position of the Marxian socialist movement is that it emerges not just as a critique of liberal capitalism as it was beginning to instantiate itself in the 19th century, but also as a critique of the socialist movement that emerged simultaneously. But it was not a critique for critique's sake. The errors of the utopian socialist movement were not just that they were theoretically wrong, but they were politically not helpful. And many times it is hard to reconcile scraps of this or that theoretical writing with the actions of Marx and Engels or any of the other major figures of the movement, including August Babel, Kalski, etc., with what they wrote. Because their internal understanding and development of concepts was still limited by the fact that they realized they had to function in a political context and often had to justify and rationalize their actions. We ask ourselves this though, not to get into a fine grain historical point. The history of the left is useful. It's good to know, but it is just a thing to know. If you don't actually apply it, it doesn't really mean much any more than knowing the entire backstory of a priorly debunked Star Wars extended universe, it becomes an intellectual hobby. The important point here, though, is that at no time, even when people did not make their critiques public, did they drop them nor did they not share them amongst comrades. After all, if they did not, we would not have them today. The reason why we know these critiques, even when they were not made in the public press, is because they were shared in letters and amongst key members of the movement. And they did so under duress. Secret police were everywhere. The Metternich Government was out to get them. Different capitalist forces were out to get these socialist groups. And so the stakes were high and their skin was in the game. They were not just arguing for people who were oppressed, although it is true that a lot of the leadership of the socialist movement was not actually of the class of which it was arguing. But they actually had to put their skin in the game. Marx wasn't going to get a nice tenure track position because they, they didn't exist yet, but even if they did, for writing capital. We can pour over this as arcane exegesis, as we often do, but is it useful? I come back to a story that a friend of mine always reminds me about Lenin. Now, your critiques of Leninism aside, you should listen to this. Whether you believe in the Bolshevik form of communism or not. Lenin always advised that people should know the social classes as best as they can. Know them not abstractly, not just in their form and function in the economy as abstract nodes, but as people. What was their mindset? What were their cultural biases? What were their strengths and weaknesses? 
things that you cannot just know from stats, but you have to be able to know these people. And indeed, this is why the coterie of many of the social reformers and revolutionaries historically came out of people who were able to move between classes, even if their analysis said that only one or two classes could be the subject of history, because they understood the mindset of the people they were fighting. Do you? A friend of mine asked me today, accurately, why do I always go on about my political history? Is there some therapeutic notion going on? After all, I have adopted one thing from Christopher Lash that I have thoroughly inculcated is while your psychological health is important, therapy is not politics and therapeutic approaches to politics aim to get you to accept what is, not to do anything about what isn't. However, you should not reverse that and not take care of yourself and strengthen yourself and deal with this as an individual subject, a subject that is responsible to a collective group, a subject who is also part of an aggregate identity. Do not confuse part to whole and do not use the whole to do nothing about the part. Are you so addicted to the discourse as these very means that we're talking about here? As I talk to you through, through YouTube, are you so addicted to the discourse that you don't do anything else? Do you think this or that flash pyre debate on Twitter is actually super important? Do you even think this or that symbolic political move is super important? important. Do you know the relations between key figures on the left? Have you thought about the structural implications of what they do? Let me give you an example. Ask yourself, why did Gavin Newsom release a video, an ad, against Roe v. Wade in Florida? Yes, to stand up to DeSantis. But it seems to me that the real aim was to move socially progressive businesses back into California. Because from the standpoint of democratic politics on the national level, it makes no sense to have people move to a state where people are democratically undercounted, and you know that, because of the way they would vote. California is blue on the national level. It also is underrepresented in Congress. Having people move from Florida to California as a national politics is literally suicidal. And Newsom is a rational man, which tells you that this is a ploy for something else. Probably a national campaign. But even from the standpoint of a national campaign, this is politically destructive. It is clear that this is about business. Did you fall prey to the discourse? What about this whole debate about unionization and the rebirth of unions? Well, Biden's claiming this where unions are at a historical low point, where all the gains of the mild rebirth that we saw after Occupy Wall Street to 2019 were lost in a year. Lost in one year. All the gains. To talk about private sector unions revitalization, while the very next day crushing railroad strikes... Are you a sucker? Should this unionization be beneficial for Democrats? As certain people on the left will have you believe who write for Jacobin Magazine and have nice apartments in New York? Are you a sucker? Are you a fool? I'm angry 
I'm also angry at myself. There's two things you should always ask yourself in a socialist group. Do your leaders self-criticize? Have I been stuck up my own ass? In many ways, I have. Why is the left not really afraid of government? Why does the left think that since the military takes a progressive stance on certain issues, that it would necessarily be in its favor if it suppressed the right? If things have gotten that far, if we're in deads of lead territory and the military is stepping up to bring peace, it is into no one's benefit that you allowed it to get that far. It is true that a lot of the higher-ups in the military are good liberals culturally. It is also true that they view their job as maintaining international capital, the blue water trade system, the entire apparatus of capital, of which not just the nations you dislike, but also the hegemonic nations that many of you like are dependent. Are you a sucker? Do you use your hope to better yourself? Or do you use your hope to do nothing, to continue in the discourse, to talk about whether or not Starbucks employees are the proletariat when maybe logistic workers really are, even though you're not even looking at not just the development of the United States, where only 13% of the population is in blue-collar jobs, not just because you have confused reading of Marx, illustrating that you think that productive is a moral category and not productive to capital surplus value. Not just any of that, but because it also applies worldwide. The automation is beyond any nation. Do you realize that? Again, are you a sucker? Ask yourself. Why in a country where 20% of the population now identifies as completely unreligious and only 30 to 35% at most identifies as evangelical and from every single instance of funding of everything else, the evangelicals are actually declining. Are you worried about the rise of the religious right? Well, you might be concerned that they are striking out in all directions, but the evangelicals are not even generating their own intellectual core in either theology or law. They have left us mostly up to Orthodox Christians on theology and Catholics on law. A Catholics who are also out of step with both the laity of their church and even now, the authority figures of their church. Are they really that much of a threat to you? They might actually be. But should you be afraid or should you be ready to fight? Now, I don't mean random stupid acts of violence. If you watch the channel and my discussions lately, you will know that I do not think that's wise, that I do not think that's helpful, that I think that breeds the kind of responses that actually you don't want. But if 71% of the population supports gay marriage, why are you going to let them try to have a theocracy? Ask yourself, are people training you to be victims because victims give money for other people to fight for them and do not fight for themselves? It's not even a grift, right? It's not even that. It's that these institutional incentives need money, need money to do the same thing that they've always done, which has obviously not been effective, or you wouldn't be here in the first place, but now they're asking for you to be afraid, and they give them the money so they can advocate for you, even though they have not been effective, or you would not be here in the first place. Think about it. Are you a sucker? Are you a fool? I've been told that I am too harsh on these issues. What matters is not meaning or narrative. 
What matters is truth, meaning our narrative, what we might be using to understand that truth. But we are often using it to not understand that truth. How do you deal with the fact that for all the talk of how progressives represent all the oppressed peoples of the country, that they are richer and whiter on average in every poll than the general population, even than the reactionary conservatives? We're also pretty well off and right, I might add, although they're from poorer parts of the country. But how do you explain that? How have years of being told to do things like check your privilege and all this, which we've now largely abandoned from the discourse because it's becoming quickly apparent that it wasn't helpful and that the only people that could benefit from it was the right or rich people who could use your pseudo solidarity because you didn't understand their mindset. You just thought in typologies and you have let it go, but without criticizing yourself. I have to criticize myself because I have been too interested in being liked by other leftists because I want my show to grow because I think what I talk about is important. But I also am just as given to seeing every stupid little like click and watching every little share on Twitter, even though I know that a lot of the discourse I see from the most shared on Twitter are fools. And I won't cut words about it. Ask yourself, where is the bourgeoisie? One of, there's two reasons why I think we become obsessed with the PMC discourses. Because one, they are people with social power. They being a strata of both managers and educated people who have done their norm and are more well off, but are failing and falling down too. But we have not asked even the good progressive people to be more competent. All we do is mock them when they fail and believe them when they do well. Just like in America, everyone became, the empire has been crumbling since 1974. Where were you? Probably not born yet. Neither was I. In fact, the entire post-war social compact and the rather anemic family wage and social subsidies that emerged from it, which led to the 1950s being the era of which all Americans base their entire assumptions off of, yet also don't really seem to understand how much they have lost and continue fighting petty squabbles. This, this was only seen after it was over. And your moral contingents about this only come at the end. Better late than never, I suppose, but better never late. I have friends who push back on me in a bunch of different ways. And I listen to them. And this speech is as much at me as it is at you. But I am not a sucker and I refuse to be. Are you blowing hot air to convince people one by one that you're going to move them to your cause? That's like trying to de-radicalize every radicalized kid. But then are you convinced that, be, that you will stand up for the victims and that you can speak for the victims out of your sense of compassion? Because frankly, no one gives a shit including the victims, as they have already been victimized and or are dead. And the dead, my friends, bury themselves. Think. Don't post, talk, justify your positions. And also, don't belong to organizations that will not let you criticize them. As you should be self-critical. But you should also be critical of others. Remember, the origins of our movement was the criticism of the failures of the prior movement. Don't be a sucker. Ask yourself, is your discourse helping you understand things? Getting you to know people that are not like you? getting you to understand and see not just their strengths or the strengths and diversity or some abstract, but also their weaknesses, what they don't see, what they cannot see about themselves. 
And are you taking that knowledge that you see in them and also applying it to you? And if any organization shuts that down, why are they shutting it down? Are they helping the revolution to do that? Or are they cosplaying in very pathetically small games of power that can often have very dire results on the individual? Particularly as things get worse. And for those who think things are uniquely bad now, I remind you that the 70s was more violent than now, both in terms of, of criminal action and in terms of political violence, even in the United States. But it was also true in Europe. And that led to a reaction, my friends. It didn't lead to a revolution. But there are other things you can do if you want things to change. Many of my friends who think things are one think they can hide in their enclaves of good educated liberals and leftists and be safe. Or that they can run to another country. I've already been all over the world the things that happen in the U.S. happen everywhere. And they're not just happening here because the system that undergoes this is not contained within one nation. And anyone who tries to show you a politics that says that it is, is fooling you. They probably don't even mean to fool you. What is it that it serves? Ask yourself, what did defunding the police actually do? Not, I'm not here endorsing the right-wing narrative that it just led to an increase in crime. Nor do I think that most of the problems that have the plague cities that are strewn with violence to deal with it. But you did not come up with any viable solution to that problem through defunding the police. You had to be more ambitious, call for more, more things to deal with the social problems, more things to deal with the, with the generational poverty, more things to deal with it, not just to funnel some money between some bureaucratic services, all of which are overly invested in semi-neoliberalized overhead anyway. Like huge parts of these budgets just go to contractors. You're not going to be helping them by shifting the money around. You had to change something fundamental. And you let people water it down. And that has a price. And that price may be worse than doing nothing. If you believe that you are in danger like you say, then your habits and discourse makes no sense. And if you don't believe it, then you're a grifter, a coward, or a fool. Or worse, self-deceptive. Do you think that the working class works in tandem just because you want it to? Ask yourself, who benefits from lower unemployment, is it just the rich? Or are there certain strata workers who do too? I've misstated that. Let's correct that. Ask yourself who benefits from higher unemployment. Why would this be a rational calculus to take? It'll be objectively bad. And it probably won't work. Because also, we have no answer for COVID. And don't pretend like we do. There are things we could have done to mitigate it. Rebuild our institutions. Re re redo our infrastructure. This would have inc incurred massive government investment. Instead, they tried one shot with vaccines. And when that worked well in the beginning, but worked about as well as anyone who studied the history of respiratory vaccines would have predicted, particularly when those vaccines are not distributed simultaneously worldwide, and that's an undertaking no one's ever had to do before. What do you think would happen? Well, it actually has a knock-on effect. It causes distrust in vaccines. It, it, it also means that people just turned away from the problem because they don't have a solution and they'd rather just dig their hands in the sand and further delegitimize things like the CDC and good liberals who are totally parasocially attached to these leaders, even when they're frustrated with them, change the narrative as they're being told to change it. They follow the news cycle too. 
And just, just keeping things in the news cycle count for helping. Ask yourself that too. Are these symbolic arrests over Roe v. Wade going to do anything about it? It'll keep it in the media cycle. But it's but people's lives are already affected. The biggest thing it kept in the media cycle was that teen year old girl. Whose discourse are you serving? A friend of mine that I've been talking about a lot tonight asked me, why doesn't the rich hate you? Think about that. Because they don't. You might annoy Elon Musk, but you're not going after the New York Times, who, when Biden floated forgiving, forgiven student debt months before he ever intended to do it, so the New York Times can talk him out of it. And then he could say, oh, it's to stop. We can't. It'll contribute to inflation, even though it's in the backs of the young. Oh, we can't do all this stuff, even though it's on the backs of the poor. We can still give. 48 million, 48 billion dollars to a war that we're supposedly not in. Even if it's just, does that make sense? I was wrong on that. I thought Zelensky would realize that NATO was willing to bleed Ukraine dry in a larger geostrategic fight with Russia. I was also horrified that instead of taking a peace position, people instead decided that the peace position or the revolutionary defeatist position was to back Russia. And not even take the position of, of semi-neutrality like China. No, not even that. But I was wrong, and I was wrong on both counts. Internal Ukrainian politics can be consolidated now, and I didn't think about that. I should have. The internal consolidation of politics is what always happens in war, and I know that. Was I a tool? I was. I have a small audience. It didn't really matter, but it is something where I could have been talking about something more important or being more realistic or giving you a better idea of what's going on instead of engaging in a bullshit media spun war of a narrative so that we can no longer even get to the truth. See, the truth is more important. The truth won't set you free, but you will only free yourself if you have it. Not some narrative, not some impressed for meaning, not some academic paper, not a new journal, none of it. We are part of this system. And if the system is breaking down, we are breaking down with it. But we do have choices. I don't usually cite John Michael Greer because his metaphysical beliefs are strange and his politics went in a very strange way in 2016. But you know what? That's not as important as the ideas that he expressed. Systems can change based off interventional actors at crucial moments. That was what I was trying to get you at path dependency. That's what I want you to see. And when systems break down due to over complexity and over energy exhaustion, when their seeming way of life seems exhausted, there are ways to fix it. But it is actually by being both Bold and aggressive and more humble at once. Because to continue the status quo and to not change is cowardly. And to just enable everyone to think they can be what they are as they are now, as the world needs to change in the future, is not just cowardly, it's sociopathic. I'm sure people will say that this or that is uncouth, that I am stigmatizing this or that person. And unfortunately, because of the way language works, that will always be the case. Does that mean it is good? No. And I do try to change my language as we, as we need to talk. But does that discourse serve our understanding or distract from what we need to do? Ask yourself that. 
We don't have to throw other people under the bus to do what we need to do, even linguistically. But are we getting bogged down in these things when there are other options? I've been saying the same things over and over again in interviews, so I'm going to say this now. Don't confuse our own personal psychology for the truth. And don't let yourself be so sucked into a dopamine addicted discourse pattern and confusing that with politics and confusing the small numbers where you're at with politics that you cannot view the truth and that you make excuses for failure. No excuses. If you believe the stakes are as high as many people say they do, you're running out of time for excuses. Good night.